Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Try again. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Well, uh, welcome to the School of Engineering Dean's Lecture. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm Jian Ming Q. I'm Dean of the School of Engineering. So each year I have the pleasure to invite some exceptional speakers uh, for campus uh, to give the lectures. Past speakers have included educators, inventors, entrepreneurs, and industry leaders. Their lectures has covered a variety of uh, topics and disciplines, and they have enlightened, informed, and educated Tufts community. Um, all kinds of topics, including science, engineering, education, entrepreneurship, and business. So our speaker today is no exception. He co-founded Rocket Software in 1990. As Rocket Software's president and the CEO, he guided the company's acquisition, partnership, and strategic technology investment. He's also someone who is deeply involved and cares deeply about building the communities and giving back to the society to make this world a better place. He's currently a member of the Board of Trustees of the Boston Medical Center. He sits on the board of Loving Spoonful, a Boston-based nonprofit focused on food rescue and filling gaps in food supply chains. He's also a member of the Berkeley College of Music Presidential Advisory Council. With all that activities in his spare time, he's also a guitarist and a pianist. He has given talks on the connections and meaningful links between music, software, engineering, entrepreneurship, and business. So without further ado, please welcome, please welcome Andy Jonas. Thank you, thank you very much. That was a big introduction. So hello everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here at Tufts University. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside, so I really appreciate you coming here and spending an hour or so uh, listening to the story of Rocket Software and a little bit of my life because it's hard to tell the two stories independently. Um, as you heard, I'm CEO, President, co-founder of Rocket Software. Back in April of 1990, a colleague of mine and I decided to start the company. Uh, we named it Rocket Software. We named it Rocket because we really wanted to be rocket scientists. That's what we wanted to do. And when we started the company, we had business cards printed up, and we had our names, Andy Yunus. My title on the business card was scientist, and I thought that was pretty cool. I'd go visit customers, and I'd hand them my business card, and they'd look at me kind of funny. What do you mean scientist? I thought you ran the company. I said, I do, I do, but I'm a rocket scientist. And so anyway, the joke didn't really last, but the name of the company lasted, and it's been Rocket ever since. We've had the same company name, the same logo. Um, ever since, and so it's been a 30-year journey, and I'll tell you about that journey. A little bit more about myself, we have in our family a strong connection to Tufts University. My wife graduated from Tufts um, back in 1983 with a major in math and a minor in economics, and she's very involved in the university. She's on the board of advisors for the School of Arts and Sciences. She's also up for nomination to be on the trustees of the university. And so I promised her I wouldn't say anything that would derail that nomination. So keep me honest along the way. Um, we're also very involved in the community, as you just heard. Um, I sit on the board of Boston Medical Center. And if you don't know, Boston Medical Center is a kind of a safety net hospital here in Boston. It serves the population that none of the other hospitals uh, care to serve. And what we do at Boston Medical Center is we provide exceptional care without exception. 
And you'll see as I talk about Rocket, there's so many parallels between what we do at Rocket and how we service our customers and how we think about our community of customers, very similar to how Boston Medical Center serves uh, the needy uh, citizens here in Boston. Love and Spoonfuls is another board that I sit on. It's the same thing. We're trying to solve the problem of hunger in Boston, and we, we take excess food from grocery stores um, that would otherwise end up in landfill, and we rescue that food, and we deliver it to people in Boston who, without it, would go hungry every day. And then you also heard I'm on the President's Advisory Council at Berkeley College of Music. I am a computer scientist. I am an entrepreneur. I run a business. But I'm really, really deep inside me, I'm a musician. Um, so I play guitar. I play piano. And you'll hear some of that story today as well. So what I want to talk about is how you can build a long-lasting company, um, especially in the world of tech. And you don't see this very often. You don't hear this very often. Many of you who are young students today, and I talk to a lot of you, you want to come up with that great idea that hopefully Google or Facebook wants to buy for a few billion dollars from you. Um, and that's certainly one way to do it. And another way to do it is what we've done at Rocket, which is try to build something that not only spans 30 years, but that spans well into the future. And if you think about over the past 30 years, all of the technology that's been changing, it's really hard to build something that's long lasting in the face of all of those changes. So to give you a little bit of a, a hint as to what I'm going to talk about today, I think the recipe for success for long term is certainly about technology. You can't have a good tech company if you don't build good technology. But it's about values. It's about vision. It's about strategy. It's about really planting that flag out there and defining the outcomes that you're looking for and marching to those outcomes. It's about wanting to have impact in the world. Uh, and while you're doing all of that, staying authentic, being true to who you are, not trying to be something else or someone else, and try to have a little bit of fun along the way. And you can see the little icon that I put in the fun circle is a musical note, because at Rocket, having fun authentically is about playing music. And so I'll tell you some of those stories. So here's Rocket over the past 30 years. Um, this is my life over the past 30 years. We talk about ourselves in chapters. The company started. We didn't call it chapter one at the time. We were just trying to survive at the time. But we started in a bedroom in my house. I literally woke up on the morning of April 16, 1990. I walked from my bedroom to what would become the nursery when we had children. And I started coding our first set of products. Early on in our life, after the first couple years, we entered into a partnership with IBM. Our second chapter began in the second decade of the company, and we started buying businesses. We started acquiring businesses. And we did that originally so that we could find talent. We were a small company. We started in a bedroom of my house. Nobody knew Rocket Software. And so we couldn't find engineers, students at Tufts and MIT and Northeastern and other local colleges and universities wanted to work elsewhere. And so the way we could get our hands on engineers is we started acquiring businesses in the Boston area that had engineers. That also helped us become global because we moved we, we started acquiring businesses beyond the borders of Boston. And I'll show you a little bit of that roadmap in a minute. Our third chapter began about 10 years ago when we brought on private equity. So I don't know if there are any business students in the room. Um, for the first 20 years of our life at Rocket, we did everything based on our own capital. We grew as fast as we could build and sell software. In our third decade, we decided we wanted to accelerate that growth. And so we brought in outside capital. We brought in private equity. And many people would have suggested that was a bad move. Why would you take 20 years of a business and give up control to a private equity company? But in fact, it was the best thing we ever did. We grew the company in that last decade over six and a half times. Um, 
And then we entered into our fourth decade, which is starting now. We call this Rocket Chapter 4. And we just changed private equity investors. We had our previous private equity investor sell their equity shares to a new private equity investor. And all of this is public. It's all online. Bain Capital invested in Rocket and valued the company at over $2 billion. And so over 30 years, we built a $2 billion company. And now over our next chapter, we're looking to grow that four times. That's our strategic directive. That's the outcome that we've defined for the company. So that's the arc of Rocket. So it starts in chapter one. And when we started the company, we just had a really simple idea. We're going to listen really well. We're going to go talk to customers. We're going to find out what they want. We're going to be good listeners. We're going to then build what they need. And we're going to do engineering well. And while we do that, we're going to treat each other well. And I came, before Rocket, I came from a couple of different companies. And at those companies, the people that were treated the best were the salespeople, the people actually made the money. And I always thought that was a little bit backwards because salespeople couldn't be successful unless we, the engineers, built good software for them to sell. And so when Rocket started, I said, we're going to treat everybody well, including the engineers. In fact, we're going to try to treat engineers better than everybody else because at every other company, they weren't treated well. So that was our formula for success. And then what I found out early on as I started meeting customers and working with partners, um, music started to creep into the company. I was a musician. I've always been a musician. When I was the age of many of you in this room, I tried to make that decision, should I pursue a career in computer science. And back then, computer science didn't even exist, so it was math with some programming involved. Um, or should I pursue a career in music? And I got really good advice from one of my professors who said, music will always be a really good hobby for you, but it'll be a lot easier to make money if you pursued <laughs> computer science. And so I took his advice. But this music thing was inside me. And so as I would meet with customers and partners, and we'd start talking about music, um, I got the courage to not only talk about music, but actually play music. And so when I'd go visit some customers or go visit some partners, and they would say, hey, come on over. Let's have dinner, and let's play music together. I got up the courage to do that. And that started in our first chapter where you know, we were known as Rocket Software, but also the CEO who plays guitar and has no problem getting up and jamming with our, our customers and partners. And so you'll see how that kind of takes off in Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, we start to go global. As I said, we started acquiring companies. Um, we started to acquire companies beyond the borders of Boston. We actually started to become this home for what I call underserved companies or underserved technologies. There were a lot of businesses that we looked at that were not getting the love and the care and the attention that they deserved. The owners of those companies were spending money on, in my opinion, the wrong thing. So we would acquire the business. We would invest more money in the technology and the engineering, trying to build better products, trying to better serve that customer base. And then we ended up becoming this melting pot of lots of different things. I'll show you on the next slide all the different things we acquired. But Rocket became really interesting because we were trying to figure out how do we get all these different cultures and histories and languages and behaviors and value systems to come together as what we call one Rocket. Um, so. I think you're starting to get some of the theme that in a technology company, technology is interesting, but that human element is really what makes it all work. How do you take people from different cultures? How do you take people from different languages, different backgrounds, um, and, and get them to work together for one common purpose? And then in the second chapter, we started to play more music together. Um, the person you see in this, in this slide is uh, the bass player in our band. Um, we acquired a company that he was part of um, out in the West Coast. And the first thing I did when we acquired that company um, is fire him, because he was in the marketing department, and I wanted to spend money on 
technology and engineering. So this is Rich. He's a really good friend of mine. And we met the day I fired him. Um, but it was the best thing that ever happened to him because right after that, he started up his own marketing company. And the first thing I did was I hired him as my outside marketing firm. And so for over 15 years, Rich has been my PR guy. Um, he's been there with me as we've tried to tell the rocket story. And he's been the bass player in our band. Uh, he's a really good musician. And so this is, this is our chapter two. These are the types of things that we acquired. I didn't list the names of these things because they're really not relevant. But you can start to see the location, the geography, the type of asset. Um, is it a public company that we bought private? Is it an asset from a public or private company? Uh, you can see we bought bankrupt companies. We bought companies uh, in the Netherlands. We bought companies in Australia. We bought companies that had R&D operations in China, all over the world. And so this, this chapter of Rocket really helped us become global. The truth is we were buying these companies and we were trying really, really hard to bring them together, but, but I don't think we were as successful in that second chapter as we could have been or should have been. We were learning. The point is we were learning. We would buy a company and we would learn and we would make mistakes and we would learn and we'd make more mistakes, but we'd learn more every time. And then that brought us to our chapter three. And our chapter three is when we really started to accelerate growth, bringing in our private equity investors, and we started to get a rhythm about how to bring acquired companies into Rocket, how to make things one Rocket. And I do believe that our brand started to, started to mean something. It started to mean something around innovation and, and good engineering, all those things that we talked about in the beginning. It started to mean something around customer experiences. What I talk about a lot is how our customers feel how they feel when they use our software, when they interact with us. Um, th that experience became really important to us. And then this thing called the Rocket Band uh, came alive in Chapter 3. We actually got up the courage to become a band um, and go on stage and perform in front of people. Um, we would do this in safe settings. We would do this in community settings where it was our customers, our partners, our friends. Um, and and it, it, it became this big part of Rocket, where today we have over 100 people in the Rocket Band um, from all over the company's landscape, every single office all over the world. We have musicians. And we come together in different configurations. Um, I was in India earlier this year, and we had a, a group um, playing Bollywood music. I was in Japan, we had a group, uh, they were teaching me some songs that are familiar to them in, in Japan. Uh, we get up on stage with a horn section from the Netherlands, our percussionist from the UK, our keyboardist from Paris, you know, Rich playing bass from uh, the Bay Area. I'm on guitar, someone else is on guitar, and all of us get together and it became this kind of personification of this idea of one rocket. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter um, what language you speak, what your background is, your, your history. Uh, when you're together on stage, Rocketeers make amazing music together. And that became a metaphor for the whole company. This is what we did in chapter three. Uh, we started to accelerate our growth through more and more acquisitions. And you can see kind of the size and shape of those here. Um, and that, that led up until this year, and this year we've acquired three different companies, most recently a company in Switzerland, and that's where I was last week, and I'll tell you some of those stories in a minute. So as we transitioned from our first private equity investor to our second private equity investor, they did a lot of research on Rocket before they decided to invest. And what they heard from the customers that they talked to is exactly what we tried to build from the very beginning, that in fact, Rocket does treat engineers better than anyone else. In fact, Rocket does treat customers better than anyone else. And just to give you a little bit of a point of view, and I'll give you more in a minute, here's the type of customers we have. So they're the largest brand names in the US, the largest brand names in any geography in the world. 
banks, insurance companies, retail, manufacturing, governments, those are the type of customers that we service every day. And those customers say that we impact the world that they live in. And we really spend a lot of time on that, where we try to impact the world that our customers live in every day. That's not just the customers that they serve, but also the communities that, they, that we all live in. Um, and we try to connect like we're doing today uh, with colleges and universities all over the world. That's in Japan, that's in France, that's in the UK, uh, that's in Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, that's in Denver, Colorado. We really try to connect with local colleges and universities um, because, and you'll hear this in a minute, that's how we believe we're going to build Rocket for the next 30 years, finding that next generation of Rocketeers. And of course, the, the Rocket Band, here are some of the, the pictures from the very beginning uh, when we performed in Bermuda all the way up into just a few weeks ago, we performed at the House of Blues in Boston. Um, and these are Rocketeers that really, again, come from all over the globe. And many times when we perform together, the first time we play together is when we get out on stage. We don't even practice together. Um, that's how much Rocketeers can connect with each other because we all, again, share that same value system or what I call the same, the same DNA. So now here we are beginning chapter four, our fourth decade. I told you we've set these ambitious outcomes to grow the company four times um, over the next four or five years. I'll share with you our vision and our strategy for doing that, what I believe um, will allow us to successfully deliver on those outcomes. Um, we're really focused in this next chapter on not only delivering impact into the world, but telling the stories around that. I'll show you some of those stories in a minute. Um, and really amplifying our brand and really putting a lot of effort behind getting the story that I'm telling you, this brand story, out to the whole world. So um, we spent some time putting together just a little bit, a little teaser to explain to people um, who Rocket is. And so if I click here, this should play a short uh, little video. So I think what that'll play at the Super Bowl coming up, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, but you can see we've, we've taken this 30 years of rocket, and we've, we've put it behind this brand um, tagline, which is Legacy Powers Legendary. And so uh, let me just tell you a little bit about that. So for 30 years, again, we've been delivering so amazing software to our customers and partners, um, really software that runs the world. Um, I'll. Sh I'll leave this up while I talk. This tells a few of the thousands of stories that we have uh, about what our customers do with our products. But what's interesting about Rocket is for 30 years we've been building this software, but today uh, when you look at our technology, you would say Rocket is really in the legacy technology space, not the modern technology space. So when we started, cloud didn't exist. AWS didn't exist, Google didn't exist, Facebook, Instagram, all the things that you guys run your life with didn't exist. What existed back then actually still runs today, still runs the world's business today. Every time you get, go to an ATM and get a machine, I guess many of you probably just use Venmo, you don't use ATMs, but if you went to an ATM, what's powering that is legacy systems. When you provision something on your cell phone, um, Verizon or AT&T can't do that without running something uh, on a legacy system. Um, so all these legacy systems, this is not a legacy, there we go, okay. <laughs> all these legacy systems run the world today and what we do at Rocket is we 
connect those legacy systems to the modern world. And so when, let's just say 20 years ago, when you wanted to check your, you know, how much money you had in one of your bank accounts, that was a pretty arduous task. Today, you just look at your mobile phone and you take and you keep pressing it and hope there's more money in there. And every time you press it, actually what happens is a transaction gets sent all the way back to these legacy computer systems and they send a message that flows back through to your cell phone. And so what's interesting about Rocket is we're in this legacy world that people think, oh, that's not interesting and that's not cool and that's not modern. But in fact, it couldn't be more modern everything that we do today connects those legacy systems to the modern world. And because people are doing more and more mobile transactions, more and more things happen on these legacy systems. And we at Rocket have more and more engineering to do, more products to build for our customers. And so these are the types of things that are being done every day in the legacy world. Um, when I was in Europe last week, I just told you we bought a company in Geneva and I visited some of our customers. One of the customers I, I visited has a legacy system that's processing $56 billion or bil euro dollars of transactions a year. It's a system that if it went down would be incredibly detrimental and this company would have to pay severe fines to the government. Um, so these things run 24 hours a day, seven days a week and never, ever, ever, ever stop running. Another one of the legacy systems uh, is used to schedule the workforce maintenance of all of the security scanners at Heathrow Airport. And so these are the types of you know, impacts in the world that legacy software has. Another one of our customers, I say legacy powers luxury, is this luxury brand um, that's really a holding company for all of these names that you see on the right hand side. Um, and you can't buy one of those things I don't have any of those things. I'm not sure if you do, but, but you can't buy any of these things um, without these legacy systems working every day. And in fact, for some of these brands like Piaget and Chloe and uh, Mont Blanc, when you walk into those really fancy stores at um, you know, our Newberry Street um, or you know, where I was in Paris the other day, when you walk in, the, the, the uh, point of sale systems are now on iPads uh, and it's all of our software that's, that's driving all that. When you want to buy one of these things and they're pressing around, you're actually using our software to do that. So, so we're in the legacy business. Um, that's kind of how it's evolved over 30 years because when we started, that legacy stuff was modern. And I promise you what's modern today will be legacy in 30 years and so we at Rocket have a long runway to go because we're always going to be taking care of these legacy systems and we'll keep moving with that legacy technology. But what makes it all work, what makes it all hang together, why I think we'll be successful for another 30 years is because it always starts at Rocket with our values. Everybody at Rocket knows these core values. We talk about empathy and humanity and trust and love all the time. And I shock people because I do a lot of technology talks and people are waiting for me to talk about JavaScript or they're waiting for me to talk about AWS versus Azure. And I want to talk about love and I want to talk about trust and I want to talk about humanity and I want to talk about empathy because that's what really makes Rocket work every day. Caring about each other, truly understanding when a customer calls us and is unhappy why are they unhappy? What do they need? Why do they need it? Why, if our software didn't do something that they expected, is that a problem for them? And until you truly understand that, until you truly internalize that, until you really have empathy, I don't know how you can be in the customer service delivery business. You just can't do it. You can talk about it on PowerPoint charts, you can read about it, but unless you truly empathize with the customer, it can't work. And in humanity, you've kind of heard this story of acquiring businesses and private equity, and in that world, you don't see a lot of humanity. It's all about profit. It's all about how much are you investing and how much return are you going to get on that investment 
and what are your profit margins and are you going to deliver that much to the bottom line every day. And so what I have found interesting, challenging, difficult, but energizing is how do you live in that world and treat people really well? How do you live in that world and really treat people with humanity? Truly care about them, care about your employees, care about your customer, care about your partners. How do you deliver software in this world where every other day you're reading about something where there's a cybersecurity hack, these customer names and social security numbers and credit card numbers somehow get disclosed to the world? How do you live in that world and truly be a trusted, a trusted supplier? And then how do you do that all with love? I mean, truly loving each other, loving what you do, loving the people you serve, loving the communities that you live in. This, to me, is the business plan. Empathy, humanity, trust, and love. And so we've kind of put all of that together into our vision statement. If you think about everything that I've talked about, can we create legendary impact in the world through our innovation and legacy technology while focusing on our customers, being a high-performing company, being accountable for what we do, and staying true to our values of empathy, humanity, and trust, and love? And so I'm sharing with you now, these are the strategic slides that I have um, presented to the whole company just a few days ago to say if we're going to win in chapter four, if we're going to succeed and achieve these ambitious outcomes, we're going to do it by living and breathing a culture of high performance and accountability. We are going to do what we say we're going to do. Um, that's easy to say and hard to do. Um, can we absolutely deliver every day on our commitments to each other? And so um, we've said that we're going to, in chapter four, deliver on all of our commitments, and then we measure with our employees, are we really living this humanity and empathy and trust and love? And so we have these employee surveys and we hear from them, um, it's not called employee satisfaction anymore, it's called employee engagement. And so our goal is to achieve 90% employee engagement. 90% of our employees should be saying, I wake up every day, I know why I'm at Rocket, I love why I'm at Rocket, I know how what I do impacts our customers and our partners, and fits with our strategy. And if I can get 90% of our employees to do that, then I think we'll be successful. Here's some of the results from our last employee engagement survey. This was 2018. We haven't done our 2019 survey yet. Um, and so you can see we're at 82%. So we have a way to go to get to 90%. We also want to embrace customer centricity in everything we do. So really put our customers and our partners first and live this these words that we say we're going to treat our customers better than everyone else. And so we measure our customers' satisfaction. We do this every day. We send out surveys to a group of our customers. Um, and it's not called customer satisfaction anymore. It's called net promoter score. Is there anybody in this room that knows NPS or has heard of NPS? You all know it because you've all gone to a hotel or gone to a store and you get this email survey that says, how likely is it that you'd recommend what you just did to a, to a, a friend or a colleague or a friend or a family member. That's a classic net promoter score question. How likely is it that you'd recommend, in this case, Rocket, to a friend or colleague? And if you score 9 or 10, it's really likely you're called a promoter of that brand. If you respond uh, 1 through 4, you're a detractor. And if you're in the middle, you're called a neutral. There's a whole science on this net promoter score, and so you take the number of the percent of promoters less the percent of detractors, and that's your NPS score. Um, and so we want to achieve a net promoter score of 70. We think if we can get 70% of our customers say, yeah, it's really likely that I recommend Rocket to a friend or colleague that we'll be successful. Today our net promoter score is at 42. So we have a long way to go to get from 42 to 70. So we want, to, we want our employees to love us, we want our customers to love us, and then we want to make sure that any market we choose to enter, we're going to lead in that market. We don't want to be second. We don't want to be third. We want to be a leader in the markets that we choose to play. And so we've chosen three legacy markets to play in. And this is 
how we say we're going to lead in those markets. Um, and so we have everyone in the company, every single Rocketeer, there's 1,500 of us. Um, we are in 15 different countries. Every Rocketeer, doesn't matter if you're in China or Russia or India or the Netherlands or Australia or Japan, um, you know all of this. You know exactly what we expect from you as a Rocketeer. You know what we're trying to achieve with our customers and you know how you fit into um, how we're going to lead in those markets. And in chapter four, if we can do all of that, plus continue to innovate, some of you in this room are familiar with what we call Rocket Build. It's our hackathon. It's how we branded our hackathon. I didn't like the name hackathon. It didn't sound right to me, so I wanted to brand it differently, so we call it Rocket Build. Rocket Build is our hackathon where we invite rocketeers, local colleges and universities, customers and partners, and anyone else from the community to join us and innovate. It's a week-long event where we ask our people, our rocketeers, to just get out of your day job and go do something different, go create something. I don't care what you create, just innovate, innovate, innovate. Try things, fail at things, learn new things, build things, hence Rocket Build. We want to continue to innovate in our fourth chapter. We want to continue to find the next generation of Rocketeers. We call our internship program Rocket Ships. Um, I think that was, this is definitely this year's um, class of Rocketeers. We had 55 summer interns in our Waltham office alone. That's our headquarters. Um, so in our chapter four, we want to invite as many people into Rocket as possible for summer interns. We have you do real work. It's not um, just fun work. You're actually building real software that our customers and partners are going to use every day. And we think we can be successful in Chapter 4 if we learn how to be better musicians and, and have bit, uh, bigger and better gigs. Um, again, that was the House of Blues just recently in Boston. But take care of our customers deliver on our commitments, lead the markets that we want to play, continue to innovate, find the next generation of, of Rocketeers, and have fun while we're doing it. And that is the story of Rocket, and I believe that is how you build a company that can be long-lasting. So I tried to go through rather quickly so we had time for Q&A, because I think the best part of these talks is your questions. So who is brave enough with the first question. Oh, okay. thank you. Chris is going to hand you the mic. At Rocket, we have these really cool microphones. They're embedded in um, these soft cubes, and we throw them at each other. So when you, like if you need it, we just throw it, and we encourage people to throw it as far as they can across the room. But we'll just use that. That'll be fine. <laughs> Um, I was wondering why in the past decade you've shifted. I noticed that you only bought uh, one company in Boston and you'd switched to being much more on a broader scale. And I was wondering why you shifted so far away from Boston instead of balancing both global and local. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, th that wasn't by design. So if there was a really good company in Boston that fit with our strategy, we would look at it. Um, there's, there's just so much opportunity out there. Right now, more of it's outside of Boston than inside of Boston. Uh, but if you know of any good companies that are local, let me know uh, for sure. But that was not by design. Yeah. Right in front of you. It's going to be hard to throw the microphone. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I think it's well, maybe even like dangerous because it's pretty heavy. Uh, question is, what about the team? Like, did you start long or you had a team? And if yes, with the team, what was the role of the team? The team from when we started? or Started, yes. Uh -huh. When we started, started. Uh, that's a really loaded question. Um, I have to be careful what I say. So when we started, two of us started the company. Um, the, the truth is the company was really me doing all the engineering, and the person who co-founded with me was actually working somewhere else. And so Rocket was me for the first, I don't know, six months maybe, uh, building all the software. Then we hired our first employee. Um, who was a master's uh, student at MIT. 
uh, which sounds really great, but he was actually the brother of a friend of ours. And so <laughs> that's how we found him. Um, and so then it was the two of us, uh, Matt and I, building the software for the first, I don't know, nine months. And then we started hiring friends that we knew. And so, it, but it's, it's, remember, we didn't have money. We didn't have any capital. So it started very slowly. And, and as quickly as we could sell software and make money, we would hire more people. Uh, I think our first salesperson was brought on um, seven or eight months after we started. So it was very small. It was very small. Um, and so if you plotted Rocket, it, would, it was growing slowly, and then we'd buy a company, and then it would grow, and then we'd buy another company. And so you, know, you can do the math from zero to 30 years. We went from you know, one to 1,500 employees, and it kind of went very linearly with steps every time we'd acquire something. It's the classic bootstrap. <laughs> it's what it was. So in the back. Good morning, Matt. Yeah. So um, employee retention is strong, and I'm kind of hedging how I want to answer this because is that good or bad? I don't know. <laughs> you know, employees come to Rocket and want to stay at Rocket forever, um, and that's a good thing and it's not a good thing at the same time. We what's interesting about Rocket is we have set up R&D labs all over the world. So uh, in, in Russia, in China particularly, um, and India, where attrition is typically in the 20% you know, ish range, and our attrition is always, always, always single digits. Like we just can't get it to nudge above single digits. Um, and so just to give you a little bit more around that, so what that means is over time you have an employee base that doesn't change, it doesn't turn over. And to be able to innovate, you need to have new ideas and fresh ideas. Um, and so we are going through right now an intentional um, skills transformation where we're saying thank you for your years of service. And remember, we're all about empathy and humanity. Thank you for your years of service. Uh, what we need you to do is train the next generation of Rocketeers so that we have new, uh, you know, fresh ideas coming to the company um, so that you then have a nice off-ramp out of the company. And you can also look at that as your legacy back to Rocket. You may have known this piece of technology really well, and maybe you're one of five people in the world that know it, and now you've trained five other people. That's your legacy to the company. So. I apologize for taking your question and running with it, but attrition is always a tricky thing. And, and in a tech company, you have to try to have some attrition, but not too much. And sometimes you have to intentionally manage that, if that makes sense. Ming. So that leads to a big question that I have is, how do you and Rocket deal with the fierce competition at the moment. I'm rather troubled that at the moment, companies, and you know who they are, the usual suspects, are literally just throwing silly money at 22-year-olds that, that are just about to graduate. I mean, we're talking silly money, $140,000 starting salary, 100000 signing bonus. Like, how do you compete in that, with that? It's going to sound really um, corny, but this is, this is what we do. So we brought in 55 summer interns last year, and, and we introduced them to Rocket. I do a talk similar to this, and I say to them, you should work wherever you want to work, but you should work for a company that actually shares the same value system that you do. This is, values are important. Your employer, how they treat you, what they believe in, how they work with their customers is important. And, and I'm not naming names, but there are software companies out there that do not treat their employees well and do not treat their customers well. And they do that because they can. And so what I recommend and advise, and I talk with a lot of these students one-on-one, -on -one, is to say, find, first of all, know who you are and find a company that shares those same values. And look, for some, that doesn't even make sense to them, and for some, that's interesting, and for some, it absolutely makes all the sense in the world. And so the, 
the folks that come to Rocket are the ones that say, I can make a lot of money here. I can also make money at Rocket. It may not be as much as that, but I'm actually working for a company that, that actually stands for something and believes in something and stays true to that and is always authentic to that. And I don't know if that resonates with any of the students in the room here. Um, money's money, but you realize one day it isn't all about money. It is about this. It is about empathy and humanity and trust and love. And, and so we lose some people, but we also gain some people. Well, you guys work with uh, Disney Ocean. You still got those? Yeah, we, we, um, we actually have two things now. So what Ming's referring to is we took all of our values. These are the, the core values, but we have a bill of rights that we communicate with our customers the way that we uh, expect ourselves to behave with our customers every day. And we have them printed on poker chips. And we actually use those as a kind of currency and a reminder. Uh, if I see you treating a customer well, I'll hand you that poker chip that says you've treated a customer well. Um, and we've augmented that in chapter four. We have a deck of cards. We have all 52 cards. And each card has a customer story on it um, in the customer's words, not our words, but the, what they say about Rocket. And that was not even thought about. But after they came together, I'm like, wow, we have poker chips and cards, so now we have a really cool poker game. Um, and we have, yes, so we use all of that. We use, we use all of these tools to reinforce what we believe in and who we are and what we think is important. And, and when you, again, when you go talk to our customers, this is what comes out. It's like Rocket is that software company that treats us well, that cares about us. And that's how we differentiate ourselves in the world. There's another question over here. Um, I'm wondering, what do you look for in companies when you're doing your acquire hire? And the other thing is, how do you bring people from another culture and make them adapt to your own culture when you buy them from other companies? Yeah, wow. two, two excellent questions, because that's the, the key to Rocket. So we have a team that evaluates companies. We're looking at hundreds of companies a year. And we have a scorecard that we use to evaluate things. But some of the highlights on that scorecard, we look for um, good products, uh, what we call sticky customers, so customers that, all, that use that product. It's hard to swap it out for something else. We look for good management teams. Um, and then we look for things that we don't have. So, if we need a sales team in Geneva, Switzerland, we'll look for that. If we need more engineers in Germany, we'll look for that. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but you get the gist of We have a very disciplined process we go through. We have a team. We have a, a, a senior vice president of corporate development who leads that team. And nothing comes to me until it's gone through all of those filters. And then we sit down and we do our diligence on that team. And then we decide whether it's going to be a good fit or not. That's, that's half the equation. The other half is exactly what you asked in your second question, which is then how do you make it all work? And the, the thing that I've learned is geographically, physically, the farther you are away from Boston, the harder it is to make it work. Um, and that's, it just, it just, you feel less connected. And we try everything we can to make that company feel like they're part of Rocket. So we, we send um, our integration team to the acquired entity. Uh, we spend time with them. We walk through you know, our culture and our values and our vision and our strategy. Uh, we give them poker chips and we give them cards and we really do what we can. I mean, it would be so much easier if I could go there and I had this tool that could just extract their old DNA and put rocket DNA into them. That would be amazing, right? But, but we don't have that, so we have to figure out how to make all that work. Uh, we bought a comp company in Perth, Australia, 18 months ago, and we totally screwed it up because Perth, Australia, who's, has anybody been to Perth, Australia? It's far away. It's far away. And when you fly from here to Sydney, you're not even at Perth yet. You've got to go another six hours to get there. And so it's so far away, it was hard to get a rocket team mobilized to get there. And so we got there late, uh, and that made them feel really bad. And we can't go every week. We can't go every month. We can't go every quarter, so they feel really bad about that. So I was just talking to the Perth team last night on the phone, which is like the worst way to do it, but I just can't 
be in Geneva and in London and Paris and Perth at the same time. It just can't happen. And so, so it's about it's about this. It's about treating people well. It's about making them feel like they're part of Rocket. And the further you are away from Boston, it's just harder to do. So we have a company in New Zealand that we want to buy. It fit all of our criteria. It would have been a perfect fit. And I said, we're not going to do it because I know we're going to screw it up because we can't be in New Zealand when we need to. And I don't want to do to them what we did to Perth. And so, um, so we're passing on that one. So I know it is. It's way nicer. <laughs> It's way nicer, <clears throat> but I just, I, know, I just know where we are in our early days of Chapter 4. We just can't do it. So, so you have to have the right screening and diligence process, and then you have to right, have the right integration, and if, you, they, and if they don't work together, it doesn't work. So it's a great set of questions. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, so uh, I have a follow-up question to that. Uh, I'm curious to know if you've learned any lessons from... Uh, integrating it up and observing like these other companies' cultures and like lessons you could take away from uh, those pre-existing cultures, things that they do well that maybe we don't do well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me think of a, a good example of that. Um, I mean, I think our our team in Sydney, um, which we this was an acquisition we did a long time ago. What they did really well was they were experts. Um, in their local community. So they knew every customer in Sydney. They knew every bank in Sydney. They said, you know, we can't do the world, and, and we actually can't do all of Australia, so we're going to do Sydney really well. And I think that focus is something that we learned that, if again, if we're going to go kind of attack a market, we're going to have to know it really, really well. So that's something we learned from the Sydney group. The group in Germany... Um, I think we learned a lot about rocket build, that picture on the side. The German engineers were uh, incredible innovators. They were doing innovation way beyond what we were doing. And when I kind of asked, well, how do you, like, how do, you do that? And it was all about you just have to physically create the time and space to do that innovation. And that was like the aha moment for me. It's like you can't just talk about it and hope people do it. You have to say, okay, this week we're innovating. <laughs> We're going to stop doing this, and we're going to innovate. And that was something that I learned from that, that team in Germany. Um, so there's just a couple examples. Um, the newest one in Geneva is, is really interesting because we have a product that does a certain thing, um, but the team in Geneva, this company in Geneva, kept beating us. And so we just went and acquired them because <laughs> they did it way better than we did it. Um, and I, you know, I, told, I was just there last week, and I told them that. I said, you know... Because they were worried, like, what are we going to do? Are you going to get rid of our product? Like, no, no, your product's going to get rid of our product because you guys do it way better than we do. And I got under the covers and learned how they did it. Um, and they just did it. They just attacked the problem differently than we did, and it was so much better. And, you know, lucky for us, uh, we were able to buy them. So there's just a few examples. <laughs> so, Yes? My first project at Rocket? Um, it's going to sound so silly, but um, back then when Rocket started, this, this idea of um, relational databases was new. Does anybody know what a relational database is? Rows and columns. I mean, it's so obvious, but back then it didn't exist. Um, and so every large company in the world was buying these relational databases, and they were just pumping data into them. And then they realized, uh-oh, we don't know how to get data out of it. Like, we can't make any sense of, like it had stored all this data, but things like SQL was, were new and people didn't know what that was. And so they would hire engineers who were writing queries against the database, but they didn't know how to write the queries. And so those queries were literally crashing the database. The database was just, you know, couldn't process the, the way that they wrote their queries and how much data was coming back. So the first product that I wrote looked at the queries that were being written, identified the ones that were written poorly, wouldn't let them get to the database, but if I messed up and let a bad query go, they'd also monitor how they were running, and if it started to use too many resources, it would stop the query. It'd say, you know, I can't run this anymore, because if you do, the bank won't be able to process any transactions. So it's really getting inside of SQL and optimizing it and monitoring it and governing it and, and tracking it and canceling it and all of that stuff. So I don't know if that means anything to anybody in the room, but that was the first 
the first product that we build. Yes. So uh, thank you for this presentation. It's really great to hear all these things. I am curious, this is getting to the, uh, I'll get very specific. If I wanted to have a job with you yep. in Red Rocket, what are the attributes that you are most interested in that would get me hired? <laughs> now, now, wait, hold on. I got, I got the mic now, man. <laughs> so my first answer, and everything I'm gonna, everything I'm gonna say is true. My first answer is we need a drummer for the band. So that is, that is a true statement. Uh, and and we've said we will hire any drummer and teach them whatever they want to know. <laughs> Because our drummers are all ex-rocketeers right now, so that's a true statement. So drumming would be helpful. Um, so, uh, and, and honestly, well, the musical thing is like this, it becomes a self-selecting thing. Musicians tend to find rocket. Um, so, and I think it's really appropriate for where we are right now. What I'm looking for, we look for at rocket, is um, well-rounded people. So liberal arts education. Um, that's what is the success. If you look at successful rocketeers, they come from liberal arts education. Um, our successful engineers come from that background, our, success, our successful salespeople, our successful marketing people. So there's this idea that you have to be a specialist in whatever you do, and that's not true. At least at Rocket, that's not true. So we look for well-rounded people, especially in engineering, I need you to be an excellent, computer scientist. You don't have to know every language in the world. You have to know something. We'll teach you other languages. You need to be excellent. And then you need to be able to communicate what you're doing to everybody else in the world. That's, you know, and if I think about engineering, that's what we look for. Um, we have really talented engineers who are good writers. We have good, excellent engineers who are good artists. Great engineers who are good musicians. It's that well-rounded um, you know, humanity that we're looking for at Rocket. Um, I hired, I say I hired because this was a friend of mine's son who went to Connecticut College. Um, that's where one of my daughters went. Um, he wanted to get into sales. He graduated from college. He had a couple of jobs that weren't interesting. He wanted to get into sales. And he came to me for advice and he said, you know, how do I get into sales? And I just spent some time with him, got to know him as a person. Uh, and I said, you know, we'll hire you. Because he had all those ingredients. He was a good person. Um, he, he cared about the world. He'd done a lot of community service. He was smart. Um, and he had a desire to learn. And so we hired him. And he is, uh, we have a, class of salespeople called BDRs, business development reps, who source opportunities and then hand them over to salespeople. It's kind of where you start if you're starting in sales. And he was our number one BDR last year. Um, and so you don't have to be an expert when you come to Rocket, but you have to have all those other attributes that I talked about. And then a passion for learning, which I know all of you here who are students have a passion for learning or you wouldn't be here. Um, I think that's what works for us. That's, that's the, the ingredients for Rocket. Let's uh, take one more question. Uh, how did you find out the need for your first project? For our first project? Yes. Um, it, this not, it's not very interesting of a story. I had worked for a startup company in Boston who was doing something similar to what Rocket is today. Um, I was their first engineer that they hired, and the person who started that company sold the company after about two years. He got very um, anxious, and he, he said, this, is, this thing's getting too big, and he had 30 employees, and that became too much pressure for him, so he sold the company. And so I went to the place where he sold it, and, and it wasn't a good fit for me, so, um, so I left and started Rocket, really doing the same types of things we had started in this other company. So I knew the customers, I knew the market, I knew the technology. 
but now I had the freedom to build what I thought the world needed, not what someone else told me the world needed. So, um, so that was really where the magic happened. I, I was free to go do what, what I thought was right. Um, if he hadn't sold that company, I don't think Rocket would exist today. I think it would have been a different path, but luckily he did, and luckily I was able to connect with my partner and start this, um, this thing that 30 years later is what it is. It's, you know how those things happen, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Andy, for an intriguing story of a how the success of an engineering company rests upon its value of the empathy, humanity, trust, and love. It's really fascinating. So thank you again. Let's give Andy another uh, round of applause. Thank you all.